Hello and welcome to The City, a new public affairs show produced by the City of San Angelo. I'm Anthony Wilson, the Public Information Officer for the City. and We are joined today by Assistant Director of Water Utilities, Tom Kerr. We are here to talk about the Hickory Aquifer, which soon will become San Angelo's newest water source. Tom, welcome. Well, thank you. We appreciate your having us here. Well, tell us a little bit about the, the Hickory. Now, we have owned the water rights to the Hickory Aquifer for, for many decades. Tell us how that came about and why. Uh, the city acquired the water rights in the Hickory back in 1971, and the reason was at the time they, we were under a severe drought, similar to the conditions we are now. And so the city did acquire those rights, acquired easements up to San Angelo, started drilling wells. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, 71, 73, we had a couple of hurricanes and a tropical storm that replenished the lake, so that, that project was relieved at that time. So why is it that we haven't developed that water source in the 40-odd in the years uh, since then? Uh, that would be basically because of the, the hurricane fern that came in uh, in 1971 and then uh, Tropical Storm D in 73 replenished the lake, so the, the need wasn't there to fund it and take care of it. And so in the 40 years since then, we haven't really needed it, oh, so uh, I assume that it didn't make good financial sense to go ahead and develop that source when it wasn't needed. Yes, but in the, in the 80s, we started uh, working with the CRMWD to develop the, uh, the ivy source, and so that became a very good source for us at that time, and uh, until now, the source hasn't really been necessary. Now, there's a perception, I think, that the hickory is being developed right now to address the current drought situation that we're in, but in actuality, the planning on this pro project began in 2008. Talk a little bit uh, about what the plans were at that time. Uh, we had been pursuing several areas. Uh, since the late 90s, the city had looked at many options. And then in 2006, the city was looking at brackish water that was local sources. But those didn't turn out to be feasible. Uh, with, the, with the drought continuing and uh, the situation becoming more and more prevalent, the city decided to go with the source that we did have. We already had acquired and secured. And so the city moved forward with the Hickory project. And so the, the plan when we began this in 2008 was that it would always come online in 2014. And this project currently is not necessarily to address the drought situation that we're currently in. Uh, it's a source that we definitely wanted to bring on because we did see that we always can use more water and need more water. Yes. Yeah. And I believe the water director told me at, at one point that the projection was that the need would really peak in about 2020. So having this come online in 2014 would have been well before that point. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. What, uh, tell us a little bit about the project cost and how it's being funded. Uh, the project overall cost is projected at $120 million. Uh, that is being funded through a low interest loan with the Texas Water Development Board. And those loans are being repaid with? Uh, those will be paid through the city uh, fees on our water usage. And uh, tell us a little bit about the project's infrastructure. What, uh, what all is involved with developing a well field? Uh, this project includes uh, several projects, of course, and uh, the first is the collection piping in the well field. That's about 10 miles of piping to bring all the wells together. Uh, we have a 62-mile transmission pipeline that we're bringing to San Angelo under construction right now. A booster pump station and equipping the wells, that's a project that's under construction right now and then the uh, construction of a six million gallon a day ion exchange treatment plant which uh, is projected to be complete in summer of 2014. Now when you talk about ion exchange and that's how the water is going to be treated, talk a little bit about that process, what it involves and why it was chosen. Uh, ion exchange is, is in this process is going to be used to take radium out of the water and it's uh, very effective at that, it's cost effective and there are methods for us to dispose of the ion exchange material uh, available. So it is the method that has been selected. And one of the benefits of that is you recover much more of the water after the, the treatment process than say a reverse osmosis, correct? Very true. And that is probably the top reason that they are really looking at that. We get 99 percent of the water out of the ion exchange process. We Compared get, to how much is it for RO? I think we were looking at around 95 percent on the RO processes. I see. Nine. So has the, has the timeline for the project accelerated uh, because of the drought situation that we're in? Uh, yes, we have in the last several years been pro uh, moving much more quickly. In the last year, two years, we've uh, bumped the process, the construction times up. Uh, we were looking at probably around two and a half years to construct the transmission line. 
that's now at 18 months. So we have accelerated project construction time. And talk a little bit about that project with the, with the transmission line. It's a 62 mile pipeline, but we're not beginning at one end and building to the other. Talk a little bit about how that's occurring. Uh, the contractor elected because of the time frames that we gave them that they would start in the middle of the, of the project and then they could use two construction heads and move both directions, east and west, so that they could cut the timeline down for completion. Now, as we're filming this, it's September 19th. How many miles of pipeline have been laid to date? Uh, close to 20 miles of pipeline have been laid now. Has the project encountered any sort of uh, difficulties that it's had to overcome thus far? Yes, I think uh, one of the things that the contractor encountered right off was a rock that was a little more difficult to, con to excavate than they had anticipated. So they've had to pick up some uh, processes there. They brought in a trencher to help remove that rock more easily. And so they're making up time frame, but they're doing well. Mm -hmm. I would assume one of the things that eats a lot of time in a project like this is just winning the regulatory uh, authorization in order to, to do a project like this. That's, that's a very large part of the process. And um, yes, it, uh, you have to get approval for the projects. You have to, uh, of course, acquire the funding, but the uh, uh, regulatory steps, environmental uh, studies, as well as archeological studies, and then get uh, regulatory com uh, compliance on the uh, construction projects. Now, initially, how many wells are going to be drilled and how much water will those uh, wells yield? Uh, nine wells were drilled initially, and uh, those wells can each pump 500 gallons a minute once equipped. They don't have the pumps in them at this point, but are being done uh, then for an overall production of about 6 million gallons a day. And the city council back last month in August approved the drilling of some additional wells. How many more wells will that be and um, how much water will those wells yield? The city council elected to increase the wells by five to seven more wells and uh, based on how much money is available and the cost to do so. Uh, the five wells produce, will produce another three million gallons a day, giving us a total of nine million gallons a day. And nine million gallons, that is what our typical water usage is on a daily basis uh, during the winter time, correct? Yes, that will get us to where we can uh, achieve what we generally need in the winter time, yes. And the expansion of the project was, uh, uh, could be done simply because the bids on the initial phase of the project came in much better than anticipated, correct? Yes, the uh, transmission line bids came in much better than anticipated and uh, the other projects are doing well as also so that uh, we do have some additional funding that we can use to expand that well field. Now the nine wells that were initially drilled, when can we anticipate receiving water from those wells? Uh, July of 2013, we should have that water pumping into San Angelo. And, and why is that going to be a fortuitous date uh, uh, to, be, to begin receiving that hickory water? Well, we anticipate that Ivy will, uh, the projections for Ivy to run out of water, at least pumping water is uh, June of 2013. So at that point, the only water we will have is what is left in our local lakes. So we need this water at that time. And can the Hickory meet all of San Angelo's water needs? Only under the winter type restrictions, our stringent restrictions for no outside watering and those types of things. It, it can meet the 9 million gallons a day at that point. So, and of course, all of what we're talking about is all based upon the worst case scenario projection that we wouldn't receive any rainfall or any runoff into our lakes, correct? Yes, that's all based on the worst case scenario. We plan that way so that we can try and make sure we don't have the, uh, not get caught without having a, an ability to handle it. Of course, there's not a great likelihood that we would have experienced the sort of drought that we have the past two years, but what's the likelihood that we will get at least some runoff and rainfall that will uh, help replenish our lakes, at least to some degree? We generally will see a little bit and, uh, sh uh, you know, would expect that there'll be something that helps us out a little bit as well. Uh, so hopefully the lakes will have a little more water in them next summer. But barring that, if we do have to rely solely upon the hickory for our water needs, we can do that just fine during the winter time when our daily usage is 9 million gallons but that will require us to have the drought level three, the strictest uh, reg, uh, restrictions that we have uh, to us uh, during the summertime too, correct? That is very true, yes. We will definitely have to restrict in the summer. I mean, it, this summer we peaked at 20 million gallons a day uh, because we still allow outside watering. And um, in the normal, normal years, we're, we're generally up around 26 million gallons a day in the summer, but uh, we will have to go back to our winter usage, which means very little outside watering or none, really. So next July, we can anticipate receiving water from the Hickory Aquifer. The treatment plant, however, won't come online until the following summer, the summer of 2014. 
why is there a lag between, between those two uh, uh, project uh, phases? Treatment plants require a lot more development in terms of regulatory issues. Uh, you have to develop a pilot plant. You have to run that pilot plant for several months. Uh, you, you review analysis based on that. Then you take those to the regulatory agencies for review and approval. So that process in itself takes about a year. And then uh, from there, we, we can start with our design on the plants. So is it fair to say that that's the most uh, involved uh, phase of a, of a water uh, infrastructure project? Yes, I would say the treatment of the water is the most complex process. There's been a lot of talk about uh, radium in the Hickory's water. Mm -hmm. How much radium uh, is in it and how does that compare to what the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency standards are? Sure. The, uh, there is radium present in our Hickory water. The highest levels that we have measured have been 37 picocuries per liter. Uh, the regulatory limits were set in 2000 at five picocuries per liter. So we do have uh, levels in the water that are higher than the regulatory limit. Is it unusual for a body of water to have uh, radium in it? No, radium is present in many bodies of water. It's a natural element that is drawn out of the rocks in the, in the soil, uh, maybe where, where it is present. Uh, it's naturally occurring. It's not something you can destroy and it's not man-made. Uh, it's just present from uh, uh, in the soils. For instance, our two local lakes, Twin Buttes and Lake Nasworthy, do they have radium in them? Uh, no, they're not, they don't have radium in them. A lot of surface water sources aren't as prevalent because the water's running clo uh, faster across the tops of the soils and not as, con is not as, does not have as much contact with the uh, rocks and things that have the radium in it. Now the radium, if left untreated, uh, water that, that contains radium, what sort of health risks does that pose? The health risk is really based on long-term exposure. Uh, we're talking 70 years of a, uh, if you had 10,000 people who were consuming two liters of water a day for 70 years, uh, over that time, the incidence of cancer might be increased by one person in that 10,000. So translate liters to, ga how many gallons of water would you have to be drinking over the course of that 70 years in order to <laughs> increase your risk? Quite a bit. Uh, a liter is close to a quarter, quart of water, so uh, yeah, you'd be doing two quarts a day, 365 days a year for 70 years. So, so 70 years you would increase your, uh, the possibility that you would uh, have one additional case of cancer, but we're talking about potentially having to use the water untreated for one year, correct? Yes, that would be the most. Uh, there's been talk about uh, reducing the radium content in the hickory water by blending it with water that we currently have from our local lakes. Uh, talk a little bit about how that would be done. Uh, the water from the hickory could be brought into the water plant, as it will be. Uh, the, the lake water will be brought into the water plant. The two will be mixed or blended, and uh, we will blend them to ratios, uh, hopefully achieving the five picocuries per liter, uh, depending on how much water we have available with the local lakes. Uh, and so that blending would occur, you said, at the water treatment plant, so hickory water wouldn't be pumped into either of our local lakes. No, the hickory water pipeline goes straight into the water plant. It won't be going into any lakes or reservoirs. So what would happen if there is no lake water to blend the hickory water with? If there is no lake water, we will be compelled, given the situation, the worst case scenario, to use the hickory water directly. Um, in that case, uh, we will run it through the plant for standard treatment and uh, bring it to the citizens. It is, it would be our only source, uh, would be, be necessary in those quantities if for no other reason, fire protection is another major issue. So. Does the city need any sort of special regulatory approval in order to use the hickory water uh, without reducing the amount of radium in it? The city will have to make sure that the regulatory ag agencies are all aware, and they will be. They're, they're very cognizant of the projects that are going on right now. We will make sure they're aware in that scenario um, we would have to use the water and they would understand and we will keep them up, up to date on that. The city may have to deal with them or work with them on, uh, on uh, authorizations to do so. We've been asked about how the hickory water will affect the taste of the water that we get out of our taps in San Angelo. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, the hickory water is going to be a, an improvement to uh, the taste and quality of our water. It is much lower in salts and chlorides and so it will bring us a, a water that is, does have an improved quality in that aspect. So we're finishing up the Hickory project right now. 
Have we begun looking beyond the Hickory at, at other potential water sources? The city is uh, participating in a Tri-City Commission, which includes individuals from Abilene, Midland, San Angelo, and they are all looking at ways to maximize our available sources, co coordinate with using those, as well as finding new sources that can benefit all of the area. Of course, if people want more information about water or the Hickory, they're welcome to go to our website, sanangelotexas.us, or our uh, social networks. Uh, they can call the Public Information Office at 481-2727. And if they want to call Water Utilities, what's the number there? 657-4209. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you all. We appreciate it. We've been talking with Tom Kerr. He is the Assistant Director of Water Utilities for the City of San Angelo. I'm Anthony Wilson. I'm the Public Information Officer for the City. And after this brief message, we'll return with Code Compliance Manager, James Flores. Welcome back to the city. I'm Public Information Officer Anthony Wilson. We are now joined by our Code Compliance Manager, James Flores. James, welcome to the city. Thank you for having me. You're the Code Compliance Manager, as I said. Tell us a little bit about what code is and what it does. Uh, code Compliance is a, a division of the city that, that uh, uh, has a group of officers, some municipalities have more than others, uh, that the state charges to improve, inspect, and rehabilitate properties. So when we, uh, when we do that over our course of work, uh, the goal is to inspect, improve, and rehabilitate properties uh, according to the ordinances as written in, in the municipality that we work for. Uh, so we oversee the junk and unsightly issues that, that occur on properties. Uh, we oversee the tall grass and weeds issues, junk vehicle issues, anything that's uh, a violation of ordinance that deals with safety and health. Um, recently we've adopted some traffic issue violations that we're helping the police department out with. And the most recent activity we've absorbed is the water conservation effort um, for our contingency plan that we're in uh, from a drought standpoint. And that's why we wanted to have you on the show to talk a little bit about Code Compliance's work in that particular function. As you mentioned, you became responsible for water violations as of September the 1st. Tell us, first of all, why that move was way made, why that function was folded into Code Compliance. Absolutely. Um, I, the biggest reason, I think, uh, upper management decided that uh, um, we, you know, force multiplying makes sense uh, in many capacities, uh, and this one made a bunch of sense due to the, the, the severity levels that we are we are uh, looking into to facing with our water crises. Um, there, there was a, there, at one time the initial uh, conservation effort was based out of uh, out of an office that there was uh, uh, one individual. Um, there is six of us in code compliance, and so as the severity grew. Um, uh, the decision was made to merge that officer with our department and, and hence uh, force multiply and have the ability to have seven people um, address this issue. Another uh, reason for that merger was we were the department for the city that was typically the filing agency in a court of law, the ticket writing agency for violations for many other areas. We, we uh, oversee the zoning violations. We uh, help permits and inspections with filing on on uh, 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 illegal permits, for instance. So we were already a, uh, used to the the, uh, the contact that needs to be made, the uh, um, the uh, asking of the citizens for compliance, and then in the end, if we didn't get it, we were the department that was relied upon to uh, pursue this through a court of law or a ticket. So uh, I think the merger made sense. Uh, I think the numbers thus far. Uh, the effort thus far has been uh, tremendous, uh, and so I look forward to battling this uh, with the help of everybody, uh, not just a, a man of a department of seven men, but with the citizens in, in general, because uh, I think that's who really is going to help us make the difference. So yes, there's seven of us, which is six more than the last, but I think with the populace behind us to to, to uh, really realize the severity that we're in, uh, I think that's where we're going to make the biggest impact. And are you seeing right now? people calling uh, your offices and reporting the violations that they see around town? Sure. Um, if, if you recall, it's been in the paper, I think it's on the website. Uh, one of the first things we initiated was a hotline number. Um, not that we didn't already have a phone line or anything, but uh, internally adjustments had to be made with the officers as far as standard operating procedures, uh, hours, uh, on-call schedules, stuff like that. So uh, being co code compliance has always prided themselves in 
in reaching out and making contact with the citizenry, I thought it was very important for us to have a separate phone line that is answered by a live individual. And if it's not answered by a live individual, within one hour time frame of that voicemail left, we are to reach back to that citizen that, that, that uh, is, is worried about a potential violation. So we enacted a, a hotline number. And uh, since the inception of that, that uh, number, it, it, is, it has been very, uh, very busy. Uh, there is a lot of people that are aware of our severe situations. There's a lot of uh, elderly people in the community who remember the 50s of walking across Lake Nasworthy. Uh, and those are the people that are really reaching out to us right now, the people that have been there, that have seen where we could be if we don't, you know, get a grip on this, this water situation. Uh, so that, that number in itself has been um, an amazing asset to, to the department. And so let's go ahead and share that number with our viewers. Uh, if they want to... Uh, report a violation and they want to do it in a rather hasty manner, what's the number that they can call? It's a cell number. It's 325-277-8906. Uh, uh, and again, if uh, it's very busy, uh, so uh, if you would kindly leave a message, if you would like a phone call back, uh, some people do call that number in on a restricted number, therefore we can't call them back. Uh, and that's okay too. And the ones that we uh, that don't restrict it and leave a voicemail, uh, you will have a call within the hour of that violation. You mentioned all the other sort of violations that code has more typically worked with. Obviously, the drought is of uh, top of mind for everybody, and uh, water is top of mind for everybody. Has this become your division's main function at this point? Absolutely. Earlier, I discussed a little bit of uh, adjustment internally as SOPs, related to, related to SOPs, um, and that was the, the first meeting that we had on September 1, was the focus is completely 100% water. That's not to say we're not going to respond to a junk and, and unsightly situation or a tall grass and weed situation, uh, but officers know that the expectation from myself and upper management is that water is the key, the focus, and the area that we, we are going to uh, devote the most attention to. Um, even if we go back to a one, I think it's important to, to sustain some type of measurable um, uh, outcome to, to help not get in the situation again. So water is absolutely top priority today. So you have your officers, they're responding to complaints. Are they also patrolling their districts uh, in search of violations? Absolutely. Uh, that was another uh, 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 make sense type of scenario that we could apply to the merging of, of the conservation effort by one into a Department of Seven uh, was because each officer has a district. Um, and, as, and if you have more officers, the littler that district becomes, which makes it more feasible for that officer to manage. So uh, each officer uh, performs uh, their due diligence, uh, water being the top priority, the other violations coming second, third, fourth, and fifth, in a district. And they are not to get out of that district. That is their district. So uh, absolutely, they are, they are on patrol. Um, the after, after, after hours of, uh, effort is in the form of on call. Uh, so there is a live body with a live phone who knows that at 3 in the morning he may get called out. At that point, they are allowed to enter another officer's district in the morning when we reconvene for the day. Uh, they exchange cases so that that officer who has that district uh, can, can work the violation accordingly. But the initial reaction is to either picture it if it's within reasonable time frame, uh, to knock on a door, then we do that. Um, we picture it, we uh, send out notification, and uh, uh, if it's a severe violation or a repeat offender, we are to go back during normal business hours to make contact to issue a citation or a summons to appear in municipal court. So you have your officers uh, out patrolling. What are the sort of things that they're looking for? What should people be looking for if they suspect that there's some sort of water violation occurring? Uh, the, the biggest uh, violation occurring today, uh, aside from uh, using too much water via some of the electronic meter reads that we're capable of, of, of looking into. The biggest one right now that we are, uh, we are fending is uh, the 150 foot violation. Uh, basically, from the point of entry of water into the street, i.e. your curb line, your driveway, uh, from that point of, <coughs> excuse me, point of entry into the street, uh, if that water has ran over 150 feet, that is a violation in any of the drought contingency stage levels. Uh, yet alone, even more severe in a two or three, because uh, that's a lot of water to go down 150 feet. Uh, that's a very typical violation, very obvious violation that uh, any citizen can, can look at and, and determine uh, and, and call it in. Um, we actually measure it uh, to prove in a court of law that it did exceed or, or, or stop at the 150 or exceed the 150. Uh, other violations are pretty common. 
uh, of sprinkler head breakages where we have water just gushing out of one head and um, you know it's 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 use is over the one inch a week allowed every seven days um, those are basically the ones that we are fending currently today uh, if we do go into a three all that is 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 irrelevant um, and I say that because absolutely no outside water well and let's talk about that just for a second okay. if we go to drought level three which at this moment the city council is saying that they will do on October the 16th Correct. there will be no outside watering does that make your job easier or harder at that point absolutely it makes it easier um, and the reason I say that is because uh, you know if you're not to be watering any time of the day and you are well then obviously that's a violation so uh, level three makes it a lot easier um, for everybody, for the person wondering, is this a violation? Is it the right time? Uh, some of the ordinance at the different stages can get a little convoluted, can get a little bit, uh, um, you know, uh, bogged down with, with exacts that um, people don't really read too deep into it. On a three, it, all that becomes pretty, pretty irrelevant. Uh, you cannot water outside. So, uh, Definitely the three is a lot easier to enforce and patrol um, than, than any other of the, of the two levels. Are your officers looking for lush green lawns, for instance, when they're out on patrol? Because we see a lot of those around town sure. and, and, and we hear complaints from people saying, you know, why is this person allowed to keep this lush green St. Augustine grass? Well, um, yeah, a lot of people have put uh, a lot of extra uh, stuff than water, I guess. I, I'm by no means... Uh, qualified to speak about nutrients or anything else that's related to greenery or grass or anything. But uh, uh, yes, that, that's one of the obvious um, perceptions that you can view from the street. Um, you know, if the neighbor next door is completely dirt and the guy next to you is, is green St. Augustine, that's not to say he didn't iron it or anything else, but whatever it is, it's still taking water to, to sustain throughout these, these, uh, these heat uh, waves that we've seen in the last couple of months. Um, so th there is some, some obvious um, stuff that we see that, um, that alerts us to maybe somebody being in violation of the ordinance. Now, aside from calling the hotline, you have two other ways that you can report a violation. One is online, and one is by calling the Code Compliance Office. Talk a little bit about that. Correct. We have uh, three, three, three means of, of, of communication for the citizens. Uh, as you stated, we have the hotline. Again, that's 325-277-8906. Uh, we have the office line. Uh, which there is a body there live from 8 to 6 every day, uh, except Fridays. On Fridays, uh, there's a body there till 5. Uh, that number is 325-657-4409. And, of course, the website uh, could, could be uh, uh, used by the citizens to, to report. Uh, all of them can stay anonymous. We don't ask for your name. We don't ask for anything. Some people uh, want to call back, and some people want a, a status report two, three days later. Uh, and we're, we're okay with that. Uh, if that's what you choose, we will, we will accommodate that, that request. Uh, but we encourage each and everybody out there in the citizenry to please reach out to us and contact us. Because, uh, again, I think seven guys can do a lot, but I think uh, 70,000 can do a lot more. So we're just reaching out to the community uh, and asking you to help, help us with this. And when you track. talk about the website, you're talking about the city's website, yes, which sir. is sanangelotexas.us, and Correct. there's a link actually on the, uh, the home page uh, in order to report uh, violations. Talk a little bit about the differences between what happens when someone incurs a first violation versus a second violation versus potentially a third violation. Well, uh, we're we're in we're in some time frame here that uh, it's a good question because uh, in a two um, our, our drought level two a drought level two our initial reaction is when we uh, verify a, a bona fide violation uh, the officer we're in an educational mode right now. We have been since September 4th, which is the first day that we hit the ground with water conservation efforts. So our goal is to, to, to reach out to you, let you know that there is a problem in hopes that, that you remedy this. Uh, so it comes in a form of a warning citation. Uh, and if contact isn't made, then a posting on the door is, is put. Uh, and then a letter is sent out. Um, as we get into closer to the 16th and closer to the drought level 3, that tact will change. Uh, again, we're in an educational mode from September 4th till if we go into a three. Uh, once we go into a three, I think with this type of exposure, the newspaper exposure that we've had, uh, everybody in the grocery stores talking about the water situation, I think the education aspect is about as, as, as high as it's going to get. Uh, and when, once the three comes in, bona fide citations are issued. Uh, they're a Class C misdemeanor. 
uh, $500 fines for the violation of this in a three. And that's not to say we haven't issued those in a two. Um, repeat violators in a two or a one um, are also faced with that same penalty. Uh, we feel that we address the issue, uh, whether it's once, twice, or three times. And um, it's time to now maybe, you know, really get you to adhere to what we're trying to, to, to do for a living. And, and, and my department uh, strives to, to enforce ordinances. So, um, I, you know, we have written bona fide citations in a two, and we can write them in a one. Uh, but the first priority of an officer, whether it's a junk vehicle violation, whether it's a tall grass or weed violation, or whether it's a water violation, is to, to, to make contact, reach out with the citizens, and give them expectation of what we're, what we're asking for. Um, that, is, that is direction for me. Um, I believe in that, and I think it, it's gained us more compliance by discussing it, by, by uh, talking to the citizenry, than a ticket, than a fine, than a court appearance. Uh, but there's got to be a point where we, we, we draw that line and we realize, you know, we've been out here two times, Mr. Wilson or Mr. Smith or whatever, um, you know, I, 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 I'm going to issue you a citation now. So um, citations have been issued in it too. So uh, the first uh, time they're visited by an officer could be a warning. Second time it will be a citation filed in the municipal court and then those penalties escalate with each uh, additional citation. Correct. Again, in a three, um, you know, the initial violation is a fine, uh, is a bona fide ticket. Could uh, be a $500 fine. It starts at a minimum of $500. Um, so it could be in excess of $500. It, it could be, depending on whether or not a three is justifiable under the health and safety and welfare of the citizens. A violation of that sort uh, constitutes a $2,000 fine. Um, we are currently awaiting some legal opinion on whether or not a uh, uh, violation of the drought level three uh, constitutes a safety and health and welfare issue. So if it does, it could be a two thousand dollar fine. But the bare minimum to start out with is a is a five hundred dollar fine through the municipal system. And and all those cases are prosecuted through the city's municipal court. Yes, sir. Give our viewers just a couple of ways that they might be able to conserve water. Some well, easy things that everyone can do around sure. their home. Um, you know, I, I uh, I'm very cognizant of some of the landscapes that are that are put into properties are uh, very cognizant of the value that they add to property values and of course that's all my department strives to do is sustain or, or, or elevate property valuation. Um, so we, we, we're being very cognizant of that and some of the simplest things or some of the things I've heard about, well what about my trees, what about my plants, you know you, you, you expend about five gallons going from hot to cold depending on what, what your water heater is set on at your house when you get in the shower. And one of the simplest ways to, to conserve some water is to put that, that mop bucket or the five gallon bucket in the shower. Uh, fill that up and use that water for uh, watering your plants or your trees. Um, it's amazing how many gallons are gone down into the sewer that you are charged for, uh, so you might as well utilize them. Another big one is, uh, uh, you know, many people, uh, I know uh, many of families that have uh, uh, reverted to washing their dishes in the sink and using that gray water and capturing it as well for the same type of function. So there's a lot of things you can do that, that may seem very minute and petty that, that in the end, in the big picture, uh, justify for a lot of gallon, you know, that you can capture and reuse. Another one is, you know, check your toilets, check, check, your, uh, check your leakage, read your bill, stay on top of your bill because that, that is going to be your, your, uh, uh, the most informative piece of uh, information that you could possess to, to know whether or not you have some extra usage and, and, and uh, that could be a leak in a toilet, that could be uh, a simple gasket fix on, on a, on a, uh, on a uh, spigot of a uh, you know, sink or something. So it, there's little bitty things that you could do around the house that I think would, would equate to hundreds if not thousands of gallons of water that, that we could reuse. And again, all those tips are on the city's website, which yes, is sanangelotexas.us, yes, sir. where people can also report their violations really quickly remind folks of the two numbers they can call to report violations if they see those occurring. Sure. Again, the, the uh, cell phone hotline, any hour uh, of the day, seven days a week, is 325-277-8906. The office line is 325-657-4409. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. We've been talking with James Flores. He is the Code Compliance Manager for the City of San Angelo. I'm Anthony Wilson, the Public Information Officer and we hope you'll join us for the next edition of The City.